So it's so funny, Matt asked me for a walk-on song, which I thought was a pretty cool idea, and I had two choices. Do I pick a song that's good, or do I pick a song just to troll the audience? Um, and so I've had to listen to that Lego 2 song about 300,000 times. So I felt like I would share it with the audience. It's, it's, it's pretty good. Um, so I'm Pete Cheslock. Uh, I'm the VP of products for Chaos Search. Uh, anyone who has, who's heard of Chaos Search before that doesn't know who I am? That's an important point, because, so no surprise, we're a brand new startup. We just launched in, in April timeframe. I just started there about a year ago. And uh, what we've basically done is turned um, Elastic, uh, S3 into an Elasticsearch cluster. And so uh, it's, it's a challenge that I've been very passionate about. I'm a former operator. I've ran a lot of Elk and Elasticsearch clusters. And so um, it's, it's a pretty cool product. And I'd love to chat more about it. But that's not what I'm here to talk about today. You can also find me on Twitter. I'm at Pete Cheslock. Although in classic form, I don't really tweet too much about technology anymore. Uh, I got a smoker because I'm a suburban dad. And uh, it's mostly just Pete's meat tweets. So um, all right. I can get this going. All right, so uh, I was a technical operator for a very long time, uh, running infrastructure, running on Amazon. I, I was at a lot of different startups. Uh, most of you probably haven't heard of before, uh, although Dyn, Dyn DNS is kind of like the one that people have heard of before. Poor one out for Dyn. Oracle kind of killed that one. Sorry, Oracle. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I made this change over to, to the product side, uh, and I got to do this. Uh, so who here has, sorry, sorry, Maddie, but sorry, Pedro Duty. Um, who here has pager duty or some sort of way gets paged for their job? Just a quick show of hands, right? So this feels as good as you think it does when you're just like, duh, delete. Um, and what's great about being in product is I've yet to run into like a 2 a.m. product emergency. Like I need a PowerPoint like ASAP, uh, at least not yet. So uh, what am I here to talk about today? So 2013, which in some ways feels like a lifetime ago, but in other ways seems like yesterday, I actually submitted a talk to my first DevOps Days I ever went to. It was DevOps Days Austin. And, you know, tweeted it out. I was so excited. You know, hashtag. I was doing the Twitter right. And um, what I noticed is that everyone was talking about, like, I need to hire DevOps, and here's how you hire these DevOps, these elusive unicorns. But then no one talked about, well, how do you keep them happy? And how do you keep them at your company and not going somewhere else? So then I got the email that, like, hey, your talk was accepted. This is great. And I was really excited. But it's classic fashion for me is that now I'm freaking out because I'm actually have to put this talk together. <laughs> and in my classic uh, chess lock move, I finished the talk the night before I had to give it. Um, so 2013, again, seems like a really long time ago. Um, Solomon at PyCon talked about Docker for the first time uh, that same year. I mean, can anyone imagine a world before Docker? It seems like, uh, you know, a lifetime ago. Um, and so, I created this talk, and, and, and the whole point of it was not only attracting the talent, but keeping them happy, keeping them there. But I think what's most interesting, this is actually a slide from the old deck, and it's, it's aged a little bit. If you notice, it's actually four by three instead of widescreen, because no PowerPoint supported widescreen. But I actually didn't say DevOps on here. I said system automation, release engineering operations. I was very anti the concept of DevOps as a job title. And even from some of the talks here, you can see one of the things where people kind of you know, do DevOps wrong is when they're like, oh, we built the DevOps team. It's a DevOps problem, right? Just a brand new silo. So I was always very, um, very annoyed with the uh, kind of title of DevOps. Um, so what I've basically done here is kind of went back to this old slide deck uh, and, and basically see, hey, what aged well? What didn't? What have I learned in that time? Uh, since that time, I've probably interviewed hundreds of engineers across three different companies uh, and built out a couple of sizable engineering teams. And so I really wanted to just go back and say, like, okay, what were some of the incorrect assumptions that I had? And, you know, just share some of the learnings. So uh, I always like to make a little bit of a disclaimer here is that there's just no one true way. There's no one way to do it. And actually, you need a lot of different uh, methods and techniques in order to recruit and retain, because every, every company is different. Um, and this is, again, it's based on my personal experience and, and conversation uh, at events like DevOps Days and just from, like, books and blogs or whatever. Uh, but also, like, I've been wrong a lot, and I have screwed up. I've hired the wrong people. I've let go of good people. I've had good people quit. Uh, I've just screwed up a lot of times. And that's actually, honestly, a really great way to learn. But the most important point is that you just can't keep everyone at your company. Eventually, people are going to leave. And they might leave because of simplistic things like, I'm going to get some more money over at this place. Um, they might leave because, like, you just are not giving them a challenging job, or they want to grow in their career, or they want to completely change. Um, you know, I, cha I changed a job recently to be a product person. Um, you know, I was never going to get that at my previous company. So the biggest thing, though, is that your employees are your biggest investments. And this should be very obvious, but the time it takes to hire, 
to train, to bootstrap, that losing them is a massive hit to your business. Um, so in the past, I talked about recruiting is really hard uh, when you work for companies that no one's heard of. And I've worked for a lot of companies that no one has heard of before. So I was really trying to think, you know, is this still the case? Um, you know, and it's really, again, strange to be rewinding back just six years ago. Um, but back then, there weren't a lot of companies, as many as today, that were like going all in on cloud. Um, I got really lucky and started at a company that was on Amazon in 2009, which was a little too early for Amazon. Um, but, you know, if you wanted to do cloud stuff, there's only a handful of places. But now, like, everyone's doing the DevOps with the Kubernetes and the cloud, and, you know, it's like everyone's doing it. So there's, there's not really like, you gotta go to this place if you wanna do this type of job. You know, and, and back then, too, people just embracing, like, Chef and Ansible and Puppet. You know, now we're in this, like, post-configuration management world. Um, so the, the kind of key thing that I really realized is, like, I just don't believe that your company's name recognition really matters as much uh, anymore, just because what you do and what everyone else does from a technology standpoint is, is largely the same. Um, and a good example of this is how many people in this room are either researching, implementing, or, you know, kind of curious about Kubernetes, right? It's, it's a lot of people. It's, it's most of the audience, right? So if you wanted a job doing Kubernetes, guess what? I'm sure there's someone here that will hire you for that. So I think there's a simplistic view of, of why people join a company and stay at a company. It's the team, the technology, and the money. And I kind of even joke sometimes that it's like, if you get two of the three, you're probably happy, at least from my own perspective. If I have two of these three things, like really good money, awesome team, technology sucks, eh, I'll survive. Um, but if you don't have at least two of these three, it's probably gonna be uh, a little bit painful. So, how has recruiting changed in, in the past few years? So the bad is still bad. Um, I saw this on uh, Twitter a little while ago. Um, the bad recruiters are still bad. It's a volume business. So it's, it's really hard to read this. I'm just gonna um, just read it real, real briefly. Uh, it says, hey, Angela, I've honestly never heard of any of the companies you've worked for. She's worked for Google and ClassPass. I think she's the founder of ClassPass. Um, you know, and, and I've never heard of the school you went to, but people tell me they're okay. Um, she went to UCLA. I almost didn't write this email because I'm, I'm really busy, but I figured, why not? I'm just like, good God, this is terrible. So um, you gotta treat recruiting as the long game. So many, many years ago, and this is actually longer than that conference talk, it was probably more like eight years ago, um, some friends of mine in the Boston area, I'm from Boston, Massachusetts, we were all getting together kind of randomly for lunch and drinks and, and whatever, and we finally decided, hey, let's all get together instead of these kind of little one-off meetings and just, you know, network and just chat, and we do it like once a quarter or so. And honestly, it's, it's kind of blown up into a full-blown meetup, although I'm kind of busy and I've got kids, so scheduling this meetup, it does not happen quarterly. <laughs> um, and we don't do presentations, we don't do demos, we don't do anything like that. It's just getting people together that are in your job, that are operators. This is specifically for operators, but it, it's a very wide um, kind of group of people. And um, the joke here is that it's not, there's a Slack channel too, and, and people uh, have figured me out, which is, I started this, yeah, as like a networking thing, but it's also like Pete's personal recruiting vehicle, that whenever I join a new company, I'm just like sliding into people's DMs on Slack, and it's like, hey, like, I'm at this new place, it's really cool. Um, you know, but that's a big point, which is being a part of your networking community, because there's a whole group of people that are on the market right now, and there's no recruiter that will ever get to them. And for most companies, they'll never get to them, because by the time you hear that they're available, they've already got their next job lined up. And it's because you need to start recruiting those key people years in advance. Some of the best people I've ever worked with, I started recruiting at least two or three years in advance. Um, it's a real long game. So those relationships really matter. Building those relationship, uh, relationships, networking um, in your community, even broadly too. Um, you know, the rise of remote work is huge. You don't have to just focus on Chicago or the city you're from. Um, because by the time you hear that they're, they're like, hey, I'm gonna be moving on for my new thing, and like everyone comes out of the woodwork, it's like, no, they've already got their next role kind of figured out. Um, but that old way of spray and pray emails to candidates, it just doesn't work anymore. So I just killed a whole bunch of time talking about hiring, and, and everyone's like, wait a second, I thought you were talking about retention. But you can't keep the right people um, if you don't hire the right people. Um, if you hire the wrong people into your company, there's nothing that's gonna make them happy. Um, but also those wrong hires can be extremely destructive for not only your organization, but your sanity as well. Um, and they can cause all your best engineers to leave and, and really cause a bigger problem. And there's that concept of, well, you know, the brilliant asshole, right? And there's, there's not a, such thing as a brilliant asshole. They're just bad people, and you got to get rid of them fast. Uh, and you have to act on it extremely fast. So I keep saying, you know, the right hires, um, you know, air quote there, but I want to talk more about what I call a checkbox hire. Uh, I've hired so many people that kind of fit this description, it's really embarrassing to even talk about. 
Um, but sometimes you just have no other choice. So what, what is a checkbox hire? Um, basically, these are the people that you're like, I need someone who's got Amazon experience, um, how about some Chef, maybe some Golang, some Ruby, and there's just a list of checkboxes, Terraform, blah, 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 and you find that person and they check every box. You're like, oh, this person's gonna hit the ground running, there's no ramp time, nothing like that. Um, the problem is, is that they are experienced in everything you need. So they're gonna come in and they're gonna actually not learn anything new. And I guarantee you in six months, they're gonna be bored out of their mind. They've already solved those problems at other companies. Um, and it's extremely hard to keep them happy. Um, and if you just don't have anything new, you're like, hey, sorry, like we have two years of like work that is in this checkbox that, that you were hired for. Now again, a little bit on them they should ask, but mostly on you, is that you know, if you're just going straight checkboxes, and this is kind of a classic recruiting tactic that people are just like, I'm just hiring for someone with like four years of Amazon experience, you know. Um, so, I like to hire for a couple of really key attributes, and, and they're a little bit high level, but there's these two items, uh, intellectual curiosity and the aptitude to learn. And what I've really found is that if you really keep it just to these two items, and again, they can be broad, um, you find people who are curious, you find people who like to learn. These are the attributes you need, because almost every company I've started at, I did not know anything about that technology. Um, you know, and also too, like, like look at Kubernetes, for example. When Kubernetes, like, created, there were no experts in Kubernetes, you have to go figure it out, and that means testing and trying and learning and everything else. The technology will always change. Finding those learners, those people that are really interested in diving in, um, keeps people uh, really happy and engaged. So um, who here has been a, a, a recipient of a white, uh, whiteboard um, interview process? Is it basically the worst thing you've ever done? Um, it is terrible. I've been a part of those as well. I will never, ever do a whiteboard interview. Um, so if you are a hiring manager um, or you work for a large, um, you know, search engine based company ending in Google, um, then you gotta stop doing that, right? It's a terrible way to hire people, it just pisses everyone off. So what can you do instead though, right? Because in many ways, you still wanna gauge this person's ability on, on the technical side. And so what we did at a previous company is we actually created this really clearly defined project, that's Timebox, it's aligned with the role, um, meaning it's not like give me a, you know, sort of this blah blah whatever computer terms. I, I'm just a product person now, so I don't, I've like forgotten everything technical. Um, but it's like something that is part of their role and you time box it and you kind of see how far they can go. So very specifically what we built is we said build an API server. So if you're like a DevOps person, um, you know, you think like, well why am I going to build an API server? Well guess what? A lot of what you do is probably interacting with APIs. And building a very basic API server is actually a lot easier than you think it is. And so what we've said is build an API server that responds to one endpoint only. It can be written in any language, and all it says is just when you hit that endpoint, it just responds with the current time. And we just said, hey, at four hours, just stop, right? Now, there is something I desperately want to do, and I've, I've heard um, some, some rumors out there that there's companies solving this, but I desperately want to pay people to do this task, because it's four real hours of time but the tax implications of paying people that you're interviewing is, is weird. Um, I've heard some rumors too that like gift cards work and there's no tax thing, so um, you know, I hope to have an open space after. If anyone knows more about this, let me know, but uh, I, I don't like the fact of giving people homework. I, I really like to pay people for it because it's, it's work, right? So then we also made an escalating difficulty as well where it's like, okay, give me another endpoint, we'll do a time zone conversion, and then another one was like deploy it somewhere. You know? So you think like, okay, well, do they deploy it to Heroku? Do they spin up an EC2 instance? Do they run, blah, like run a server somewhere? Do they you know, spin up 10 servers of Kubernetes and deploy it there? It doesn't really matter how they deployed it or where they deployed it, just it's like taking it to that next level, like add SSL support, et cetera. So we had one individual who didn't deploy anything, didn't write any code, but wrote 10 pages of documentation about their thought process on how they were trying to solve this problem. And it was so clear and well written, we hired them on the spot. Um, because it didn't really matter whether or not they, they completed it. It's like, how, we wanna see how you think. How did you get through it? So from my previous slide, I had this one, which is losing people sucks. And you know, spoiler alert, it's still the worst. It's really terrible. And it cuts even deeper when it's something that's actually avoidable. So why do we lose people in the first place? Um, well, I think there's these, these items here that drive, right? And there's a great book by Daniel Pink called Drive, and it, it talks about the three items, aut autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Um, and I think um, these three items are, are really, if you can have at least one or two, that's great to help 
keep people engaged and happy, right? You have to feel like your, your work is meaningful, that you're becoming a master of it, that you're becoming an expert, that you have autonomy, that you can you know, derive value from what you're doing. So um, I had this slide about autonomy, and I took a picture of my daughter uh, on my computer because I thought it was hilarious. It's like, you know, I, I, and I said this line, which I kind of bumped on when I re read it again, but I said, you know, I tell my kids what to do, um, you know, not my engineers. Um, but the reality is, is that it's not a, you know, hey, you do this, you do that. It's like, let's have a discussion and let's, let's understand what needs to get done and, and how we prioritize that. Um, because that's a great way to have people, people feel like they have control of their job, is that they are help guiding the work they're doing. There's nothing worse than having to continually support some dying piece of infrastructure and you feel like no one's listening to you that it needs to get improved. So, you know, back off, you let them make mistakes, you kind of course correct along the way, and it's, it's a back and forth process. So, of course, this being a really long time ago, I said to my daughter, hey, can we take, take an updated one here? Um, just to show, like, how many years ago it was. Um, and it's actually not the same laptop. It's, it's a totally different laptop, but yeah, there's a lot of stickers on it. Um, and I was just really excited because she like never listens to me, so this is like the first time that she was like, oh yeah, I'll totally do that. So it was like, pretty, it was pretty cool. So I was like, we have to capture this. So, you know, you think to yourself, well, if I'm not telling people what to do, how do we get work done? So you try to align work with an owner, um, but then you back off and you give them that ability to complete the task and get it done. And it's not like you just let them off into their own little world for six months and, and have them do whatever they're doing. It's you're continually checking in. How many people here have a one-on-one -on -one with their direct manager? Now keep your hand up. Do you have that one-on-one -on -one weekly? So having a weekly one-on-one -on -one I think is huge. And it should not be like, hey, how's this project going? It should start with, hey, how are you doing? Right? That's it. But it should also slide into the let's talk about the project. Let's talk about what you're doing. Are you blocked? Are you having issues? Are you struggling? Do you need help? Do you need support? Do you need training? Um, you know, someone did a great talk yesterday about uh, taking time at your job to like read a book and learn something. I think that's awesome. So mastery. Um, it means getting better at something that matters to you, not to like the other person. Uh, and there's concepts of continuous learning. We always are learning new things. We're always trying to get better. And this is not just technical skills. This could be management training. This could be, um, you know, leadership training. This could be uh, public speaking. It could be writing. There's a lot of things that people uh, in a technical role honestly probably should get better at. I mean, I joke that I think more technical people should take a business class or a finance class. Um, do you know how your company makes money? Um, it's shocking how many engineers actually don't know. Um, hop on, if you're at like a company that sells a product, go to one of your demos and watch how they show your product to another person. You might be amazed or horrified. Um, and I just had to put, I saw this picture online. Any, any piano players in here? Um, this is like perfect representation of when you become a master, you suddenly don't enjoy it anymore. <laughs> um, so that purpose, you know, being a part of something bigger that matters. And again, it matters to you. It's not like you saying, oh, well, this is a big deal. It's like, well, it has to matter to the person, right? So. No one's ever said this, right? I want to write code that no one ever uses. It's just going to go into a hole, right? Completely wasted. Um, and writing code that is never used is extremely demoralizing. And I've been part of projects where you spend all this time and effort to build this really awesome thing, and then at the last minute they're like, well, we've had a shift in priorities, and we're going to put that on pause, or we're going to put that on hold. Uh, and then that's code for, like, it's never getting done. So open source projects, and this is something I talked about six years ago, and it's even more important now. They're not only great ways to give people ownership, it makes it easier to recruit people later. The costs are honestly pretty minimal, although if you have a popular open source project, it can be, uh, it can be a lot. But it, again, the more popular they are, um, it's a big recruiting effort for you. The benefits are just massive. So um, how many people here um, have heard of a, pro a, a tool called Sensu? It's a monitoring, monitoring framework. So um, I've talked a lot about companies that, I've that people have never heard of before. So more people in here have heard of Sensu versus the company that actually created it. So there was a company called Sony that I was working at we were very angry with Nagios, very angry with Nagios. Uh, it did not scale to handle dynamic workloads in the cloud, and we were very early in the cloud. And so we built this open source monitoring tool called Sensu. It's an open source project. It's now a company, and they're doing awesome. It's really cool. And that helped engage these engineers that were extremely hard to find and kept them at this company that went nowhere, I mean. And how do you keep those people happy and excited? It's like working on projects like this, and, and that was helping us move the business forward. So um, who here is actually a remote employee, works from home every day? It's a pretty good number, actually. Um, so this was from my old deck. Do you want to scale in this economy? This was six years ago. It's, it's even harder now to hire people, right? Um, and I think talent beats location every day of the week. Um, 
the manager of that person is actually responsible for their output. Does not matter location. Now, not everyone is great at working from home, and that's a different issue, but um, it really doesn't, and it shouldn't matter where people are contributing from. This was also from this slide, um, you know, six or plus years ago. It's kind of funny how, like, this aged really not well. Um, like, IRC, sorry, no one really uses that anymore. Skype, I mean, if you are at an enterprise that paid money for that, you probably still use it. Hey, uh, Google Hangouts is gone, it's Google Meet, you know, HipChat, you know, they're gone. It's basically just GitHub, but the reality is, is that Slack, uh, Slack has really just taken over the world, uh, and it's, it's never going away. So, all right, so now we have to talk about money, um, because this is a, a, a kind of key part of employee retention. Uh, and I actually just saw this on Twitter, and I was like, hey, why, why do you like this company? I'm like, because you pay me. So, um, I, I, I hate this line. And I've heard it before, and again, maybe it's self-selecting, I've worked at a lot of startups, but it's like, hey, everyone takes a pay cut to come here. You're gonna get so much value out of this. It's the classic, like, work for exposure thing, um, you know, and I think the line is, is you don't work for exposure, people die of exposure. Um, <laughs> the problem with a pay cut to work here is that if another company is gonna pay you more, which, guess what, they will, and if another company is willing to do an above market, which, guess what, they are, now, that above market salary offer is now a massive bump. Who would not change jobs? If you're talking 20 to 30% raise, I think you'd have a really hard time doing that. Um, it's just a cheap way of doing business and it just opens the door. If you underpay an engineer to like $80,000 a year, going, and that's the going rate for your city is maybe like 100,000, um, again, there's always gonna be a company that will overpay to bring them on. There is some company with more money than you and they will use it. So basically, you have to take the issue of money off the table. If the fact is, is you can always go make more money somewhere else, as basically the receiver of the money, I always have to say to myself, listen, it's gotta be enough where I just don't like think about it, where I don't feel like I'm underpaid. Um, of course, yeah, sure, it'd be great to have more money, but you have to basically have it just be enough to just take that issue off the table. Um, now, I, I, in the, uh, the uh, talk pay open space we did the other day, you know, I had said, if you show me a list of, of, of employee salaries at a startup, and it's pretty much any non-public startup, I can look at it and tell you how long they've been employed there. Almost guarantee you. Because the people that are at a startup, when they come on board today, are gonna get paid market. Two years ago, they were paid a lower amount because you had less money. Four years ago, even lower. And startups are notoriously, notoriously bad at going back and correcting those mistakes. And how many people have heard this one, which is like, oh, we can't give that engineer a $20,000 raise, that's too much. Or, oh, they're gonna get suspicious. It's like, no one's gonna get suspicious that you got a raise. And you could, guess what, treat them like adults and say, hey, we've looked at the market, you're getting paid less than market, and we're fixing that. I feel like, again, as an adult, I would be pretty happy about that. So there's another really critical metric, it's the STPR, um, shit to pay ratio, because I did say <laughs> that uh, there is someone who will pay you more for what you do today, but what are you going to have to put up with to do it? Um, so if you are gonna take that job for more money, uh, just remember, there's a ratio, uh, it's the shit to pay ratio, but at the end of the day, uh, underpay your engineers at your own risk. Um, and this is important today, it was important six years ago, it'll be important five, 10 years from now, um, and, and companies fall down on this so hilariously that if this is the one thing you do at your company, you will be beating out 90% of the market. And you know, you, you'll, people say, like, well, we just don't wanna hire people for money, they wanna be here for the cause. Yeah, I'm here for the cause, but I've got like a mortgage and kids that gotta go to camp and 300 other things, right? Um, your company and what you do is probably not special. You're, oh, you're doing Kubernetes on AWS? Cool. Oh, you're doing Kubernetes on AWS? You know, everyone's doing the same thing. Then we have this, my favorite one too, which is, no, 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 we underpay because you're gonna have, you're gonna get stock options. You can get rich here. <laughs> so, uh, I've still got a bunch of slides to go through and I felt really bad for Matt that it was probably gonna go over, so I, ha I can't stop too, too long here to laugh at that one, but here's the deal about stock options, and you need to ask yourself these questions, and if, and if all of them are yes, then yeah, this is probably a good one, but first off, are you a founder? Because guess what, your founders probably have, when the company starts, well, they have, if there's two founders, they have 50% of the company. And when investors come in, maybe they have like 40 or 30%. Uh, and you can see when all these startups file their S1, guess what? There's two people, maybe three, that hold a single percentage at that point. Unless you're like crazy like Slack or something where, you know, some of these companies that have grown really fast, right? But further down, I mean, in a, in a startup, it goes like the founders, and then the next hire, if you got 1% of that company, that would be crazy. Um, 
from there, if you're like an engineer, maybe you're the first engineer, you get 1%. Next engineer, maybe like half a percent, maybe a tenth of a percent. And then at some point, they just go, we're not even doing percents. Here's like 10,000 shares, which just means nothing. So also, were you granted restricted stock? Most likely, you were not. You were granted stock options or incentive stock options. Um, but if you were granted restricted stock, that's actual stock. It's, it's stock. They give it to you. But why don't companies do that? You have to pay for it or they have to gift it to you, basically, which is basically income. And there's not a lot of people when taking a new job that are willing to have to pay 10, 20, or some thousand dollars to buy the shares in. Um, and the reason why this exists for founders is that when you start a company, value of the company is zero. Those options have no value, um, and they can only go up from there. But when you come in any time after, they will have a value. Um, does that grant have protections for a change in control? And that means if the company um, gets acquired um, do, um, and you get fired, do you get all your shares? Um, that's an important thing you have to keep in mind. New CEO comes in, you get fired. I've seen that clause put in. Uh, I've seen salespeople do that one, where it's like, well, listen, if a new CEO comes in, they're gonna bring in their salespeople, so I need to have that protection. Um, is there a convertible note? Don't forget, there's debt on company, and there's all these different ways of dilution, um, and debt always wins. And this is why I kind of joke, more, more tech people need to take a business class, because if you understand how businesses get funded, you'll find out that it's really easy for those shares that you think you have a lot of to just get diluted to nothing. Um, this is my favorite one. There's a concept of liquidation preference, which is it's, if money goes into a startup, it's the VC saying, well, we wanna take that money out first. And pretty often it's like a one X, right? I put in $10 million and you get sold for 100 million, I'm gonna take 10 million out. And then the 90 is now split up between all of us, including me. But sometimes if your company's maybe not doing too well, maybe that preference is two X or three X. I've seen four X. So it's a really easy way that if you say, I'm gonna put in $10 million, but I want a five X multiple. Okay, cool. We got sold for $50 million. I'm gonna take all that money and everyone else gets nothing, including the founders. So there's just countless examples and you can Google it to see all the different ways that your stock options are just not gonna work. So again, there are just too many reasons you're probably not gonna get rich at a startup, but that doesn't mean that you can't make money in other ways. Um, and if you work for a public company with RSUs, actual stock, literally none of this applies. It's a public company, it's real stock, it's real money, you're giving it, you can sell it, and you can take the cash and run. So, okay, I did all these things you said. Someone left anyway. Guess what? Congratulate them. That's pretty awesome. Uh, ask them for their honest feedback. Uh, and, and I'll be honest on this one, don't ask them for the feedback unless you're ready for it, because you may not like it. But you should understand what the reasons are. Well, I'm leaving because you're a terrible manager, right? As we've talked about many times, you're a terrible manager, that's why I'm leaving. Um, oh, okay, but hey, this role is new and different and I just wasn't gonna get that here. That sounds awesome. Because guess what? If you've been in this uh, business for long enough, it all comes around again, right? There are people that I worked with 10, 20 years ago that I still work with, that I've come back around, I've worked with in the past. Um, this stuff lasts forever, but wish them the best in their new role. Stay connected with them, because guess what? Two or four years from now, maybe you're gonna hire them again. Um, so the other thing I always like to talk about here as well is the concept of a counteroffer, which is if someone comes to you with an offer in hand and they're ready to go, again, my personal opinion is I never offer a counteroffer. Um, and that's maybe an uh, unpopular opinion. Uh, I know some people use it as a way to get more money, which you should absolutely do that. Um, you know, always try to get the most for what, um, you know, what you're doing there. But the problem I always have with a counteroffer is, is that person is already kind of mentally there, right? They're looking at the paper and they see that, that dollar amount or maybe the opportunity. They're, they're mentally there. Um, and it gets weird. If you've ever taken the counter offer and stayed, it's weird. It's always weird, right? So I never offer, I never extend them out. Um, you know, I've had engineers get upset because they thought I was going to. Um, but if it, if it comes down to a money thing, honestly, again, as a manager, I feel like I want to know that in advance. And I've had some good success where I've had an engineer say, hey, you know, I've been here for a while, you know, I'm looking at the market, I think it's a little bit higher. If you were at the talk pay thing, there's a spreadsheet that I believe is going to be shared. Use that information to help you get a raise. But I think that's something that is different than I'm changing jobs. Um, <clears throat> so I think if someone's leaving, I just can't provide them with what they want. So at the end of the day, People, I think, really excel when they're excited about their work, when there's high levels of trust across, across the organization. They've got that personal ownership, that responsibility that they're making something better, and that, um, that responsibility to actually affect change in an organization. So just to really distill it down, you know, people need to be challenged, there needs to be ownership across the employees, high levels of trust on both sides, 
you have to trust that they're gonna get the work done, and they have to trust that you're gonna kind of get out of their way, but also, if you're a manager, you're kind of the like, you know, the, the shit umbrella, right? You gotta kind of keep, keep it up there to help your engineers do what they need to do uh, and get it completed. But that doesn't mean hide everything up here. It means, you know, making sure that they're not distracted, um, context switching all over the place. But it, it, the biggest thing on this one is if you continually give like the worst work to that one person because they, <clears throat> they will take it with a smile on their face and they'll, they'll do that work, don't be surprised when they leave. Um, because they'll just, they'll just ghost. I mean, they'll just be gone. I think it works until it doesn't, and, and it's, it's, it's pretty bad. So, but at the end of the day, you just treat them like adults, and it seems like such a basic thing. It's like, I'm gonna treat these adults uh, as adults, but it, it's funny how oftentimes companies spend all this time and energy and money hiring these really capable, intelligent uh, individuals into the business, and then micromanage them to the end of the day you know, these are highly paid professionals. You have to treat them like the skilled adults there are. Um, so uh, for open spaces later, uh, I'd love to talk about stock options. If you're thinking about going to a startup, if you're at a startup, um, I've been through this so many times. I've learned the hard way many times on all the different ways, um, things that you might wanna say. So, um, you know, keep an eye out for that later. I'd love to chat more about um, stock options and, and, and can help anyone out with that. That's all I have, thank you very much.